And so what do we do now? Let me raise some of the issues that are out there. How did we go in the post-Reagan period of American politics from having the strongest economy in the world to facing our most serious recession since the time of the Great Depression? I don't know if you're aware of it. I think many of you in this room are, but the average American isn't aware that over the last decade, even before this Great Recession began, there's been zero growth in the private sector in this country. In fact, from 1999 through 2009, we lost 1.4 million private sector jobs. And since the Obama stimulus plan began in February of 2009 through May of 2010, well, they added another 400,000, quote, public sector jobs, most of them census jobs, which since have gone away, we lost another 2.7 million private sector jobs in this country. I don't need to tell people in this room because this state has been hardest hit. And let me tell you also what disturbs me and what we've got to do something about, I believe very strongly you cannot have a strong economy without a strong manufacturing base, and we're destroying our manufacturing base in this country, and we need to bring it back. The figures are very stark. For the last decade, we've lost five and a half million good-paying U.S manufacturing jobs that have been outsourced, shipped overseas, or simply gone away. That's one-third of our U.S. manufacturing base. As I said earlier, zero private sector jobs created. And so guess what happens? And we're doing great in Texas, relatively speaking, because we're poaching jobs from high-tax, high-regulatory states like Michigan and California and Illinois and others, and we'll continue to do so because we don't have a corporate income tax. We don't have a personal income tax. And we have incentives because of a positive regulatory comment, a, a climate, and a pro-business attitude to bring jobs to Texas. But what's happening, ultimately, is it's a zero-sum game. Even if you get your act together, and I hope you do here in Michigan, you're going to be poaching jobs from other states if you can. Because the reality is that overall, we continue to lose private sector jobs. And the reality is that we're the nation that all these other nations are poaching jobs from. And I would suggest to you it's because we have the most onerous corporate tax system in the world. We tax business at 35%. The employer pay portion of the payroll tax is 6.2%. And essentially, we reward debt because debt is deductible, which is great for the corporate buyout artists and the private equity guys who load companies up with debt, downsize them, flip the companies a few, a few years later after sending a lot of jobs overseas. It's great for a few individuals or a few private equity moguls, but it's lousy for the workers. It's lousy for the businesses here in America. And I would suggest to you that's upside economics. We need to start rewarding savings, capital investment, and employment which are the engines of economic growth. So what I favor, what I favor is let's pull that system out from its roots, completely eliminate it, completely wipe it out, and replace it with a revenue neutral business consumption tax at 8%, and there's enough funds that would come in from, from that to totally replace the corporate tax, the estate tax, and the employer portion of the payroll tax, an 8% business consumption tax that would be border adjusted. All goods and services coming into the U.S. would pay that 8% tax. All exports from the U.S. companies exporting would, a credit, again, would get a credit against their exports. It levels the, trade, the playing field with our trading competitors. Do you realize we're at an 18% tax disadvantage with virtually all our trading competitors around the world? If you're trying to send a GM Cadillac priced hypothetically at 50000 into Germany to compete with a $50,000 Mercedes Benz, it's at, at the border with a 19% business consumption tax. Coming back here into the U.S., that German Mercedes Benz, and so that vehicle has to sell for 60000 there. Coming back into the U.S., that vehicle from Mercedes Benz gets a rebate tax credit tax uh, uh, abatement 
uh, back in Germany against its business consumption tax. So literally, we're at an 18% disadvantage on average with all our trading competitors, and some even higher. It's no wonder. Our people can compete. They're good workers. They're good entrepreneurs. They're good business people. Just level the playing field, bring jobs home to America, begin to rebuild the manufacturing base. You cannot have a strong economy without a strong manufacturing base. And quite frankly, not just for economic reasons, for national security reasons as well. We would not have been able... We would not have been able to react so quickly to the threat of Nazism without being the strongest manufacturing co country in the world. We would not have been able to deal with the Soviet threat with our buildup without a strong manufacturing base. We've got to get it back. What kind of leverage do we have with China when they're the banker and we're the borrower and they're taking our technology and our manufacturing? What kind of future do we have for our children and grandchildren in Michigan and across the country unless we change the way we tax business and bring jobs home to America? Let's quit exporting prosperity and good American jobs overseas. Now let me tell you, uh, I am tired of these Wall Street guys dominating the American economy. I agree with Thomas Honing, the guy who has descended on the Fed from Bernanke's policies, who says, you know, we have a Goldman Sachs, president, uh, president of Goldman Sachs, or executive from Goldman Sachs, as Secretary of Treasury under the Clinton administration. And that was Robert Rubin. We had a Secretary of Treasury from Goldman Sachs under a Republican administration, and that was Henry Paulson. And in neither case did it work out well. I concur with Mr. Honing's uh, uh, comments. If, it, if they're too big to fail, they're too big. No more taxpayer bailouts of these Wall Street financial institutions. And let me talk briefly about uh, foreign policy. Uh, I am one who served in Vietnam, and I've been very concerned about the neoliberal policies of the Clinton administration, where Madeleine Albright effectively said, well, we've got a military, what do we do for, for a military if we can't use it? So we wound up sending our military into Kosovo, the Bosnian War, on behalf of a radical KLA Islamic group against the Christian Serbs who have been our allies in World War II. Anybody who understands the Balkans understands uh, the strategic importance of the Balkans in terms of the long-standing disputes when the Muslims tried to overrun uh, the Balkans uh, historically and were stopped in the Battle of Lepanto and also stopped elsewhere. But it surprised me and disappointed me to see even some Republicans fall into that trap. The idea that somehow you can use U.S. military force it's a Wilsonian notion, Woodrow Wilson, the idea of making the world safe for democracy and using U.S. military force uh, to impose democracy on the Middle East and on nations that are really not suited for it. And whether it's the neoliberals and Madeleine Albright, or now Hillary Clinton, who seems to be directing our latest action, or neoconservatives like Paul Wolfowitz and the Bush administration, we need to understand this concept of using U.S. military force to impose democracy in the Middle East has not worked, will not work, and as Ronald Reagan has said, uh, his biggest strategic mistake was when he sent American Marines into Lebanon. I talk about it in the book, and I have his quote from his own diaries. The key is to develop a new strategy, because we won the Cold War with very little loss of American military lives, we need an effective strategy to address this very serious threat of radical Islam and understand that this is a threat as serious, if not more serious, than the threat of international communism was, but we're not going about dealing with it in the right way, and we need a new strategy to address that threat. And finally, no matter what we do to fix economic policy and foreign policy, and that's absolutely critical because the problems are more serious today than they were back then. If we don't restore the culture back to the principles of Christianity and the Judeo-Christian ethic, 
instead of the Hollywood culture of values which dominate the secular culture. I call it secular fundamentalism, which is so dominant today. Everything will be for naught. A free market system does not work without an ethical compass underpinning it. A constitutional republic will not last without, unless it is guided by the principles of Christianity and the Judeo-Christian ethic. We have, to find, we have to find our way back to our founding principles. And in conclusion, I want to quote from a passage in The Conscience of a Conservative. It's a chapter in my book, ironically, written before uh, many of the people who got involved in the Tea Party got, in, got involved. But in a way, I anticipated the Tea Party. The chapter is called A Return to Constitutional Principles. Uh, you know that. We know that. Uh, and now more and more American people understand how necessary it is. Here's what Barry Goldwater said in his book, Conscience of a Conservative, in 1960. The time will come when we entrust the conduct of our affairs to the men who understand that their first duty as public officials is to divest themselves of the power they've been given. It will come when Americans in hundreds of communities throughout the nation decide to put the man in office who is pledged to enforce the Constitution and restore the Republic. What a guidepost for all of us. And the time has come to return to the principles of federalism wherever possible power and money should be sent back from the federal government to the states and the local communities and let the people devolve power, return it to the states and local communities like we did with welfare reform. We need to do it with Medicaid. We need to do it with education. It's the opposite of what was done in the Bush administration with their move towards centralization, which has been increased even more in the Obama administration. We didn't get rid of the Department of Education. We tried in the first Reagan term, but there were some people within the administration who weren't too enthusiastic about that, so I don't think they were willing participants. But this is an opportunity because we don't have the money, and at the same time, we understand the importance of local control over education, where you can be watchdogs at the local level instead of everybody tracing off to Washington in order to get a piece of an ever-increasing, forever-shrinking pot. This is a great opportunity for us. We started again, and what's so great about this movement is grassroots bottom-up, just like when we started in the Goldwater Movement, just like what we did in, with Reagan, just like what we started to do in 1994 and unfortunately later lost our way. Let's not lose our way again. Let's bring that American dream back. I've got a bunch of kids and a bunch of grandkids, as I'm sure many of you in this room do. Uh, and we have the responsibility to bring that American dream back so we can say proudly, years from now, you know what, a lot of people said that America's best days were behind it, and we decided to make a difference. We knew we could make a difference, and we did. Let's bring America back to its founding principles. Thank you very much.